Wow. Hey, there you go. Yeah. So what's next on your fun fact agenda? Oh, um, yeah. So um, Gary Newman, uh, he's come back to her after, after he'd gone away, never to come back again. And you were on that, on that gig for three nights. He did <laughs> come back to her and he invited you back. Hey, guys, I'm not really going away. Would you come back and do it again? Um, well, to be honest, I asked him um, because we were still in contact with Gary. Um, I wanted him to play on one of our tracks and stuff, but um, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this big UK tour, you know. And um, I said, well, can we support you? And he said, yeah. Because the great thing is, it's just Tim and Sean with two dummies and microphones, no, no ro roadies with bum cracks and amplifiers and sound checks and all that shit. You know, it's just us. Yeah. So perfect for him. And his whole set was behind curtains. So we could come out and do our stuff. You got to do two numbers with me in my set. Uh, one was, I think, uh, This Prison Moon, where we decided to do it as Samurai. No, not Samurai, Ninja, sorry. And the other one was uh, The Iceman Comes, where we were all in white and doing a lot of strange undulation stuff. So that was that. And it was like seven weeks and it was probably the most fun I've ever had. Mm. I mean, it was everything you've ever thought about a rock and roll tour, you know. You know what I mean? Hey, say no more, say no more. It was such great fun because the fans loved us and we got our single into the top 70 and uh, it was all halfway through it, you suddenly thought, where the fuck are we gonna go after this? Star Wars was brilliant, but this is everything we've ever wanted. It's rock and roll, it's music, it's lights, it's sex, it's power, it's performance, you know. I mean, every gig was sold out yeah. for seven weeks uh, and it's extraordinary. And normally a support act gets, go, oh, fuck off, we want you, you know. Um, but with us, it was like tick and tock, yay. And as soon as the lights went down, then our intro music started, which was very sort of, <clears throat> people go, oh my God. And the dry ice would come out across the stage and then we'd sort of suddenly, slide out across the stage as robots and just freeze then the music would start and we kick off and it's like fucking hell everyone just went nuts you know it was brilliant it really was probably the most exciting time of my life i think yeah i think i'm sure i was there in, in birmingham um when you were there and uh, I, I mean newman is notorious for his support bands having a real hard time and you didn't get a hard time it was like <laughs> one of the few support bands that's actually had them like quiet. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah it, was, it was great. Obviously we sang live over backing tape, but because we moved so well, it was like, God, oh, you got something to watch. You haven't got to watch some guy going, Wah! you know, and all that shit. I mean, I've seen some of Gary's bands and you know, they're probably quite good in their own right. But we, if you're trying to compete with Gary and his full band, really rocking out it's not going to happen you know no, it's going to be something different hasn't it? yeah anyway so that was fantastic so after that poof, where do you go but then you had the royal variety performance yeah that was quite something um that was towards the end of the tour and uh somebody had contacted survival records and said oh we royal variety show this year is going to be dance orientated and uh, we want Tick and Top to do a number in the show. So Survival got onto us. We're somewhere in, I don't know, Middlesbrough or something and say, hey, you want to do the Royal Variety Show? Yeah, fuck it. Um, so we said yes. And they sent us a, a, a cassette of the music they put together yeah. for us to work to. And it was like a sort of BBC session man's version of electro music. Yeah. You know, it's like, do, do, de, 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 you know, whatever. 58 seconds. And um, we were doing the, the very last gig on the Newman tour, which was at Hemel Hempstead Pavilion. And we were supposed to do that a couple of weeks earlier, but Gary's set was so big, they couldn't get it into the venue. <laughs> so they had to reschedule for the very last night where they chopped the set down a bit. So we did the gig at Newman's show and then the limo took us all the way back from Hemel Hempstead to the theatre roll Drury Lane and we went to the stage door and we're already in our red tailcoats and stuff and um, 
no white face, just normal makeup backstage. And we, we hadn't even got time to be nervous because we're still high from doing Newman shows. So suddenly it's like, and now welcome to the second half. It's thick and dark and dun, 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 and the curtain rises up and all you see is these jack boots and then black joppers. And I'm thinking, God, Queen Liz is in the audience. She's probably having a flashback, you know, to sort of fascist Germany. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was great. We did our stuff. It was dun, 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 dun. And that was it, the very last time we did the robot in public. And um, 14 million people saw that. And it was quite something. Um, we, again, you didn't think about it. It was just like, okay, well, we're just on stage with Gary Newman, you know, now we're doing this. Um, went to the backstage party. And at that time, we were wearing, wearing a lot of um, torn leather and studs and fur and hair and shit. And going into the backstage party with all these ballet dancers going fabulous. And uh, there was Sir Laurence Olivier going, oh, I think you guys are marvellous. Shut up, loonies. I'm on the phone. I'm not on the phone. I'm on camera. You want to get in, don't you? Yeah. Attention, attention. Loonies, come on. Sorry. Catty interlude. Come on. Come on. No, I don't want to. Cats, hey? Just want your attention. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Some dreamies, yeah. So after that, 14 million people watching on the Royal Variety, what, what made you decide to call it a, a day with Sick and Top? Well, we didn't call it a day for quite a while after that, actually. Um, what happened was that we, we, we did uh, Cool Running, the second single got in the top 70. That was great. So Survival thought, well, the next one, Scream Me, I'm Yours. That should do really well because we had Joe Albert playing bass, Tessa Nile singing vocals on it. And it didn't, it got to number 80 and then stalled. And um, we did a headline show at the venue in Victoria, which was great. That was full, full up. Shut up, loonies. Come on. Look, sorry. Come on. Come on. Well, a couple of singles after Scream Me, a lot of live shows and um, we started to get more and more disillusioned with the fact that people only seem to really know us as just being cuddly robots, you know? And um, so we toyed with the idea of uh, f finding a, a female backing band to play live. And we wanted all Japanese girls. And um, it'd be very much like sort of Robert Palmer's Addicted to Love video where you've got us in the front and you've got these very, you know, erotic girls playing instrument for live, you know, behind us. Uh, that, that proved problematic. But um, the problem was, was that our manager at the time um, was determined that we would sign to EMI from Survival and that EMI would buy Survival out. And... Um, Nick Rhodes from Duran actually went to the A&R man at uh, EMI and said, look, you've got to sign Tick and Talk, you know, because I love them. I want to produce them. It's great. You know, I've just done Kajagoogoo, you know, I'm cool. And um, so the A&R man at EMI uh, said, OK, yeah. And he, he got us in and, you know, we, we played him some stuff and he said, well, you guys could be really fucking good. I'm going to send, you know, a couple of junior A&I guys to see your next couple of gigs. And um, we were doing Crocs in Rayleigh or, you know, somewhere in Basildon or something. And uh, the guys came and said, God, these guys are fucking brilliant. You've got to sign them, you know. And what our manager did very stupidly was send a bunch of roses to the secretary of every A&R man at EMI saying, congratulations on your imminent signing of Tick and Top. And all these secretaries will go with this bunch of flowers to the head of A&R at their department saying, hey, you know, didn't know you were signing Tick and Top. And they go, what? We're not signing fucking Tick and Top. And they go back to the A&R man that was dealing with us and they say, well, what's all this about? He goes, sorry, I don't know anything about it. And so we were dumped. Oh. And so it was like, oh, great. Now we've left Survival Records and we've just sacked our manager and we don't have a record deal. And we're really fucking fucked off. And um, 
we had a few PAs to do to fulfill our contract. And we had one last show booked at the Hippodrome in London in October 1984. So we did that. And you can't, you can't see it on the video, but at the very end, I say, well, this is the very last show we're doing. And you can hear people going, what? And that was it. It was gone. That moment, that four year fantastic journey had ended. Not because, well, I think that maybe there was an undercurrent of Sean wanting to maybe move on to work with Jane Khan, his girlfriend. But it was like, we are so pissed off about the way we've been treated by record companies, you know, not taking us seriously, even though we had a top 70 record, which is still in the Guinness Book of Records. Um, but never quite getting there, you know, and it was like, what more can we do? And there was nothing else we could do. So we just thought, fuck it. We split, and that was it. So, what did you both do then? What did yourself and Sean do? How did your paths change? I immediately thought I'm going to form my own rock and roll band, okay. which I did. And I, I, I found the keyboard player who played on our Tick and Talk Intolerance album uh, as a sort of nucleus of the band. And then, bit by bit, I found a wonderful drummer called Les Warner, and um, guitarist called Tony Lewis and a uh, bass player called Mark something. Um, and we had a band all of a sudden and um, we, we rehearsed a lot. And then we played our first gig at the Embassy Club in March, 1985. And I thought, well, this is great. For the first time ever, I'm fronting a, an actual rock and roll band and it's fucking loud and it's really in your face, you know? And then, we started to do, we, we did three actual studio recordings and I really liked those, but I discovered that Joe, the keyboard player was sort of easing us into a more kind of jazz funk, kind of Newman-esque sort of Joe Hubbard-esque era. And I thought, nah, this is not what I want. I mean, the last thing that um, the a &R man at EMI said to Sean and I was, Look, what I want you guys to do is to go away and put together the hardest electro music you can do with your image. You'll be fucking great. And we thought, no, we're going to split up, actually. But of course, a year later, it's Zig Sputnik. And I thought, fuck, that's what we should have done. Should have done that. You know, yeah. none of this sort of trying to be pop star stuff, but just really go for that full on electro with our image, and we could have made it even more so. So there you go. Wow. So wow, you got the whole story and only. That's amazing. Well, we haven't finished yet. Oh, that's God. The, that's not the whole story. Um, sure. We'd like to jump about a bit. Um, but in, in 1996, you formed Noir. Yes. Which is an interesting project uh, with uh, George from Sailor. Mm. Yeah. How I, did that come about, you may be asking? Yeah, were, were you friends or did you? Uh, well, because my ex-girlfriend Barbie by 1990 was um, going out with George from wow. Sailor. And I remembered Sailor uh, from 76. They did a TV show, not Sound of the, maybe it's Sound of the 70s, something, but they were in black and white. And they were so unusual with no guitars or no electric guitars and girls, girls, girls. And I thought, wow, that's really... You know, it's a little bit like Cockney Rebel or, you know, that sort of away from the kind of 1975 rock and roll queen, you know, stuff. Um, 1990, Barbie's now going out with George and we became good friends. I was married to an actress called Race Davis and um, we socialised a lot together. And uh, <clears throat> I had this perverse notion to write a Eurovision song with George because we both loved Eurovision and how wonderful it would be if you actually wrote a Eurovision song because the money you'd make in PRS and royalties would be monumental. Uh, so finally, George agreed to write with me because um, he put it off for two or three years. No, no, I'm not interested in that because he, he'd reformed Sailor and they were making a huge amount of money in Germany doing oldie luck tours with Smokey and the Searchers and yeah. all that lot. And then that ended and the short, uh, George thought, 
okay, well, yeah, let's try writing something. So the irony was that the very day we started writing together was the day that my wife packed up and left me. So the morning George picked me up in his car, he goes, hey, tell me, how are you? I go, oh, my wife has just left. Go, oh, fuck. Anyway, we sat at his kitchen table and we started writing a song called Talking. And I said, what about if we did a, a vocal thing? Dum, 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 dum. He said, that's really cool. And we had this vision, if we did Eurovision, we, you didn't have to actually do it. You know, as the songwriter, you get someone else to do it. Yeah. So we had this uh, color guys in, in wonderful suits doing dum, 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 dum. Dum, 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 talking. Who's talking? We're talking. But look. And we thought, yeah, this is cool. Uh, and then we wrote a couple of other songs. George came out with this idea for a song called Walking, and it was just footsteps going, <laughs> and, and a synth bag going, <laughs> and a chorus going, walking, <laughs> walking. And I thought, well, that's quite good. So I took it home and I thought, walking, that's what we do. Go walking. And suddenly we had a chorus and, and I put on some guitar on the <laughs> shut up on the choruses. And uh, I wrote all the lyrics and it was suddenly a sort of poetic rock song. And um, we suddenly found a manager called Falcon Stewart, who used to manage a band called um, Classics Nouveau. Oh, yeah. in the 1980s, I don't know if you remember them. Oh, yeah, definitely. And we did a, Shock did a tour with Classic Nouveau with Theatre of Hate and Naked Lunch, I think, mm. back in 1980. And we suddenly found Falcon again. He said, well, I'd like to be your, excuse me, your manager. And he said, yeah, I know this German um, company called Koch, which is ironic in retrospect, um, <laughs> K-O-C-H. And... Um, they're, they were dis, a distribution company, but they wanted to become a record label. And he took Walking to them as a single, and they said, oh, yeah, we love this, you know. And they made it into a single, and um, they paid for us to go to Munich and make a video for Walking. Uh, I think they paid 25,000 quid for it, which is quite amazing. Anyway, and the video was shown on Top of the Pops 2, uh, do you remember a, a, a TV chef called Keith Floyd? Oh, yeah. He likes yeah. fish. And wine. Yeah. Fish and wine. <laughs> and probably more wine than fish. <laughs> um, David Pritchard was the uh, director, producer of that. And somehow he was, he was at home one night and watching Top of the Pops 2, and he sees George and I in our black suits going, walking, that's what we do, go walking, around the streets of Munich. And he thought, God. I've got this idea for this new food and drink series called Feast. <clears throat> you guys would be brilliant to do walking in different cities, but with lyrics relating to the food of that particular city. So we auditioned for him and he goes, yeah, it's brilliant. <coughs> Excuse me. So we filmed first walking in Paris. And, we, and uh, so the chorus is us going, walking, that's what we do, go walking, every time we're feeling blue. But the verses were all about the food market and blah, blah, and, you know, eating whatever. Five, yeah. And um, the series was picked up by Channel 4, and they go, this is brilliant. So David Pritchard says, well, I'm not going to direct the next lot, but someone else is going to, can you go, name three cities you want to go to? So we said, Barcelona, Amsterdam and Berlin. He goes, well, can't do Berlin, it's too far, but how about Hamburg? Okay, cool. So we went to those three cities and did exactly the same thing with different lyrics relating to what we ate in that city. And the series came out and it, it got sort of good reviews, but then people started to say, well, why are these two guys looking like the Blues Brothers walking about, singing about walking, you know? And it was all like, you haven't really got the point, have you? It was all the thing about the series. You'd have us, and then you'd have the two wine girls talking about the virtue of wine from the sort of Dordogne area, and then you'd have a guy being very serious about the serious implications of salt, and you'd have a, a very glamorous French chef called Jean Christophe Novelli making a, a, you know, a swan out of icing sugar, and people just thought this is a bit fucking. 
we want Keith Floyd and getting pissed in front of a table. Um, <laughs> so it didn't really go anywhere, but that was it. But George and I made an album and it's great stuff. I, I love it. I mean, George is very, very meticulous, you know, and he taught me everything I needed to know about using logic as a means of making music. Whereas before I've been using analog stuff and sequences and recording onto tape and it was all a bit, eh, eh. but he said, no, logic, you can just move bars of music left back and forward and fit that in, God. And um, so, yeah, George and I called it a day in 1997 and said, well, look, you know, we did what we did and it was great. But with George, it was like him doing the stuff and me putting my bits on top of that. Mm. Uh, but his, his his attention to detail is extraordinary. He, he spent four days doing four bars, you know. <laughs> when I go, fuck it, let's do it now. Why don't I just play the bass line? He goes, no, if I program it, it's like, oh, okay, whatever. But it works, you know, it's very clinical. I mean, George's previous group after Sailor was called Data, and it was him and two girls, and they had a single called Fallout. And it should have been a big electro hit, but maybe mismanagement, blah de blah, same old shit, you know. Well, quick fire now. Um, well, quickish fire. What's the worst gig you've ever been to? As a, as the a worst punter? what? The, the worst gig, the worst concert you've ever been to as a, as a punter. Oh. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um... Or you can do the worst one you've ever performed at yourself. Oh, I can tell you that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the worst gig Sean and I ever did was after we did the Newman tour, we had a week and a half off and they were, we were offered a support act on the Flying Pickets gig <laughs> at the Dominion. <laughs> um, I mean, you couldn't make it up, but we'd already done two nights at the Dominion with Gary three weeks earlier and it was monumental 3000 yay and we do the flying pickets and it's like get off you fucking cunt and they're sort of throwing stuff at us and it's all from the heads <laughs> so that was our worst gig i mean but in retrospect it was actually quite funny but at the time it's like i can't believe why the hell are we doing this oh. why did we say we're going to support the flying pickets of all people I mean, if it had been Yazoo or Erasure or someone cool, it would have been great. But the flying fucking pickets. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't. Yeah, it's like Shawadi Wadi or something. You know, <laughs> bloody hell. Great. But the worst gig I've ever been to, uh, that's, um, that's a bit tricky, actually. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Is you, if you, have you got a record collection with something in it that you're too embarrassed to admit to? <laughs> um, that you're going to admit to, <laughs> hopefully. You'd love me to, wouldn't you? Um, oh, yeah. I don't really have a, a record collection anymore. Uh, I've only really got my own stuff on vinyl. Um, no, I don't. Uh, I know cheeky girls knocking about. Or... No, sorry. <laughs> Buying tickets, greatest hits. <laughs> <laughs> greatest hits were our heads. Um, What's the weirdest gift any fan has given you? <laughs> oh, God. Um, you can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were given a lot of bras and panties and garter belts and all that sort of stuff. You know? um, I think one, one of the strangest ones was an inflatable frog. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> that took some thought. Yeah, yeah it took some thought. Was, was it inflated when they gave it you? No, it was like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your frog, blow it up yourself. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> hell! It's and it had a huge cock. It was uh, that was the weirdest bit. It was like, okay, it's a cock with a huge dick. Brilliant, thank you. A, spe a specialist one then. Yeah. <laughs> Where did that go? <laughs> Well, that might lead on to this. So what is the happiest moment in your career so far? <laughs> it wasn't that one, I'm sure. Um, the happiest moment of my... Do you mean my life or my career? Um, 
don't either. Because I, I separate the two. Um, the happiest moment of my career, I think, was um, actually doing the Gary Newman tour. I think that sort of encapsulated everything I'd ever wanted. You know, rock and roll, sex, attention, power, lights, music, adoration, if you like, on a modest level. But all those sort of things that a boy always dreams of. Wouldn't it be great to be, you know, and for, for a brief moment, that, that was it. Um, in my personal life, I would say that uh, meeting my ex-wife was pretty amazing. Aw. Aw. Lovely. Oh, shucks. Oh, you know. <laughs> um, sorry, a bit boring. Beer or wine? Uh, wine, mainly, yes. White or red? Ooh, controversial. Uh, <laughs> mainly red, but if I'm eating sort of fish, I tend to go for white. Mm. I've actually been on the wagon for 20 days now. Um, it's only for a month. It's not like permanent. But that's quite interesting. Mm. It, it's like, uh, wow. You get this feeling about midday. Like, oh, oh, fuck. Oh, no. It's like, what do I do now? You think, oh, no. Um, it's all right. You get past it, you know. But I, I'm drinking a lot of these fuckers, um, which are smoothies and water. Uh, it, it's just I wanted to prove myself that I'm not actually an alcoholic. You know? <laughs> because I really do enjoy, hey, I really do enjoy wine. And I was drinking two bottles a night, a night or day, in fact. Yeah. You know, which is not that great, really. Hey, uh, occasional, I mean, Sean and I, ever since the 80s, we've always had a soft soft spot for Southern Comfort. Oh. You know, I mean, it's a bit sweet, it's a bit girly, but there's something very drinkable about it, you know? Yeah. That and a couple of beers, it's like, hey. I mean, what I love about Sean, when he's had a couple and he, he dispenses with his day-to-day -day life and worries, he becomes sparky. He becomes a bit, you know... And even now, I mean, I'm 70, he's 65 or whatever, and um, we're still like it. We still get, on well, Sunday, we went walkies in Covent Garden and we thought, let's have a beer. And uh, we went into a bar and stuff. And it's just like, nothing's changed, you know, in, in 40 years. That's what I love. Mm. Um, can, we, can I plug something of my own? Is that all right? This is the double CD that I have currently available. What's of my own called? music. What's it called? For it's the called reviews? Retroject. You probably... Uh, Retroject. Yes. Yeah, which means projecting back into the past. It's a double album of every piece of music I've made on my own since 1985. It's beautiful. And thank you. It's currently available on Discogs or eBay. Oh. Okay. I also have my first novella, Ricochet, which you probably can't see either. Oh, yes, we can yeah. see that. That's yeah. on Amazon. Wonderful. 30 glowing reviews. And also my legendary autobiography, uh, trying to get the shine off, Lovely. Falling Upwards. Yeah. Lovely. That's on Amazon Absolutely as well. Absolutely shameless as well. Love it. Shameless is my middle name, mate. Fantastic. Timothy Shameless Dry. But, you know, that, that's the sort of stuff I do. I still do um, Star Wars conventions, obviously. We still haven't finished yet. We've got loads. Um, um, Blackjack Black or it. fruit salad? What? Blackjack or fruit salad? Blackjack? What's a blackjack? Do you not remember well, those? The sweets? Well, che chewy little yeah. square. No, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's ask a more adult question. Well, that is a seriously oh. odd question. <laughs> adult question. Then. Adult question. Father Ted. Yes. We absolutely love Father Ted. What was that like? Well, that was pretty weird. Um, I suddenly got a call saying, oh, they want somebody to play a Vatican priest in Father Ted. It's my agent at the time. And they thought of you, of course. <laughs> As you would, looking like this, you know. And, um, well, not like this, but like then. And uh, I went along and I did a read through and they said, yeah, that's great. Uh, did a proper read through with the whole cast with, um, oh, the lovely guy with the grey hair who passed. Um, 
Dermot, no, was it Dermot? Yeah. Who yeah. played yeah. Father Ted? What's his name? Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's filmed in a studio on the South Bank and um, I literally had one line and that was it. But it, I've got to say, Ar Ardell, oh God, the younger guy who played Father Ted's. Yeah, you know. Ardell O'Hanlon? Oh uh, yeah, he was lovely. We shared a dressing room, and he was he was very warm and very friendly. And it was just a weird one day experience, you know. I thought this is so cool, mm -hmm. you know. I had to overact, which wasn't difficult, and um, yeah, that was great fun. You, you you've had quite a lot of um, TV acting parts, haven't you? Casualty, mm -hmm. The Bill, all kinds of loads of commercials. I, I've got a still frame of you. In a, in a tree ball mince commercial, I think. Oh, that was a brilliant one. Yeah, I didn't. I, I remember the commercial like it was yesterday. I had no idea that was you. Well, I was sort of fairly disguised, you know. But um, yeah. again, you know, back in then, them days, I had an audition um, because of my agent Crawfords, who were very good. I was doing castings every probably two a week, you know, and it's brilliant. Um, so you didn't think, oh, I hope I get that. It's like, I've done that. Oh, tomorrow I'm doing that. This one was like, turn of the Raj soldier in the Jordanian desert. What do you think? I go, yeah, fine. I didn't have to do anything really. I just sort of went, oh, like that. And they go, okay, great. So I fly out to Jordan, which is weird, you know, <laughs> never been that far east before. Well, apart from Bangkok, anyway. And uh, fitted with the uniform, Raj uniform, you know, pith helmet stuff, yeah. whiskers. Yeah. And um, we're filming on a train that's actually moving through the desert. And it was the same train line that was used in Lawrence of Arabia. And it really is in the middle of the fucking desert, you know, <laughs> which I've never been to a desert before. It's like, it really is sort of big, isn't it? Endless, nothing at all, there's no hotels, there's no thing. And um, sort of Bedouin tents, you know, with pots of stew and stuff. Whoa! <laughs> and um, we're on this train and there's a little guy with me also in uniform who has to say, we're running out of steam, Carruthers, we'll never get away. And I look at him and I go, <laughs> and I produce a silk handkerchief and he goes, oh God, we're gonna surrender. <laughs> And inside that is a packet of tree ball extra strong mints. And I take one, I put one in his mouth and we blow into the furnace and we zoom off, leaving 30 angry Bedouin tribesmen behind us. But they were real Bedouin angry tribesmen. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit odd, you know, because of this sort of English film crew. Oh, terribly, terribly. And these real actual Bedouin tribesmen with rifles going, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> and, um, I think the funny thing was the catering. They had all these big pots of fly infested stew and stuff and big bowls of yogurt, you know. So we're all thinking, oh, yeah, that's cool. And there was one crew member who thought, oh, fucking yogurt, I, I shit that stuff, you know, or I just eat the stew, right? Next day, <laughs> uh, he was completely gone. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you have yogurt it counteracts all the bacteria in your stomach but um that was very weird and after you've done a commercial you really do need to sink a few larges you know and uh me and the small guy eh, we're we're in the bar and um there's a buffet and uh there's all this stuff laid out i thought that's really good oh pickled eggs brilliant so i have a <laughs> few of those and i'm eating it I think I don't it's not a it's a fucking eyeball oh oh sheep's eyes thank you <laughs> it's like great welcome to our country yeah thanks a lot um that was a very strange experience anyway <laughs> what what gives you more satisfaction do you think um the film work the tv commercials and the tv programs or music? Gosh, I think, well, everything is equal, really. Um, a, a commercials I had a great deal of fun with because you, you go to other places and you, you are in, inhabiting a character, but only for a day or two. It's not like you're doing three months in the West End doing the mousetrap or something. <laughs> oh, God, again? <laughs> I'm going to improvise. It was him! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, no, there's something about commercials I love because, yeah, it is three days. You're in Jordan, you're in Germany, you're in France, you're in Switzerland, you're in blah, blah. Someone once interviewed Charlie Watts from the Stones and said, what's it like being in the Rolling Stones for 25 years? And he deadpans, well, you know, it's five years work and 20 years waiting. <laughs> but that's what the film business is like. It is like hurry up and fucking wait, you know. And you, you've got to try and do the same thing again that you did two hours ago. It's like, fuck, where was I? And obviously you get, you know, professional actors who, who are still there. They're in the park and that's it. Boom. Um, and you get method actors who are permanently in the park. You know, hello, Christian Bale. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I, I, film is, is, is different. It, it's... Yeah, when you see the finished thing, it's, it's oh, that's clever. How edited, and you did, yeah. yeah in, in context, yeah. But at the time, it's like, oh, for fuck's sake, you know. Um, I did a short movie, God, even that was 12 years ago, called Son of Nosferatu, where I played Nosferatu's son, who was, uh, <clears throat> his father died penniless, and so we had to sell the castle in Transylvania. <clears throat> and he moves to London and sells the big issue. Oh. Listen, and as you do and um at night <laughs> at night well daytime actually <clears throat> but he yeah he's not really anyway he, he's lost the ability to get his fangs out you know he's lost his mojo and um so he's reduced to selling the what well in the film it's called something else but it's, it is the biggest thing. and uh he meets this fairy who says she's been thrown out of the fairy circle and the only way she can get back in is to do one good deed to help someone. So she meets me in the nightclub, as you do, and uh, she agrees to help me get my mojo back so she can get back into the magic circle. And that was enormous fun, playing a vampire, you know, being sort of sexy and naughty and uh, at the same time. And uh, that was good, you know, because that was, that was very, that's an unprofessional movie. It's on YouTube, you can see it all in HD, but it was very um, boom, boom, boom. There was no sort of hanging about, okay, Tim, now we're doing this. You're outside, selling the biggest you. Someone comes up and you go, biggest you, and he goes, bless you. You go, fuck off. <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, it's very silly. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, the last thing I did was um, a horror movie called Dad, which is on um, Prime. It's part of a series called uh, Dark Ditties Presents. Right. And I play a, a Russian um, zealot who, who basically instigates the zombie apocalypse. And I end up cutting my own throat, which was quite wonderful, really, um, to do that. Because, you know, I've seen it in movies where you go, and, say, and you think, how the F do they do that? Well, I can. you're probably not going to see it. But anyway, but... What they do is that you've done your pre previous scene of having a dialogue with this Irish priest. I'm saying God doesn't exist. And he's going, of course, God fucking exists. Here, bro. And I go, no, 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 very reasonable. And then I pull out a knife and I cut my own throat to prove a point. And um, what they do is they, they put this sort of tube coming out from here, very thin tube up to here. And they put this layers of latex over it, right? layer after layer, very thin latex, blend it in flesh coloured makeup. So it's down here coming through your shirt under your pants and out there with a pump connected to a tub of <laughs> fake blood. Yeah. And so what happens is that they, they make a slight slit in, in the makeup here so you know where to hold the knife. And when you go eh, like that, it opens up and he's going pump, pump, pump. And this stuff literally comes out everywhere. It's quite wonderful. I mean, it absolutely soaked the suit I'm wearing, the table and everything. But it was like, God, this is the magic of movies, isn't it? And when you see it, it, it really is sort of... Well, that, that's a one... It's a one take, is it, I presume? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no way back from that. If you fuck it up, it's like, oh... Wow. Anyway, but there was one TV commercial I did in Italy for Kodak. Um, and I'm wearing a long white mat for some reason. And I'm walking through various sets. And there's one behind me of 
all this complicated scaffolding and I'm having to lip sync this dialogue in Italian, which is really, really somebody really <laughs> difficult. And uh, I, I go through, okay, okay, Tim, let's take one. Okay. And this, I've got the cue wrong and uh, I'm walking through it and the thing falls down too early. Uh, so they have to reset the entire fucking set. And of course, I'm, I'm with a crew of Italian film people who are high on espresso. And I just got my cue like 10 seconds wrong. I came out too early. So they sent the stuff down, but I'm still there. You know, it's like, <laughs> fuck, you know. A um, lot of things like that, silly things. Another thing you get with um, other actors when you get the giggles, you know, and you can't stop. It, it's difficult to explain, but some silly little thing starts it off and you go, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's going as well, he goes, no, shut up. And it goes on for about half an hour and the director's going, fuck's sake, what's so funny? And you go, well, it's not, <laughs> it's, it, hmm. So that happens, you know, and, um, oh, you know, all sorts of terrible things. I mean, one of the most embarrassing things happened <clears throat> in Italy. I was doing a commercial. I played a burglar who's trying to break into a car late at night in the street. And they give me these um, really horrible baggy trousers that are virtually hardly held up. And they took us out for dinner previously and I'd had sort of meatballs and red wine and stuff and I was feeling a little bit jolly you know it's about midnight in the trailer espresso espresso so okay Tim we're ready now okay and I do my bit I'm looking nervous and then I have to run off down the street and as I run off I fart incredibly loudly <clears throat> and I think oh Christ uh, and I keep on running because you know I'm professional and as I get to the end of the shot, my trousers fall down to my ankles. And I just think, OK, I've just farted in front of a whole crew of Italian people. <laughs> my trousers are down by my ankles. What time is the plane? <laughs> you know, it's just silly things like that. Did they love it? I think they did. <laughs> 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 you can never tell with the Italians. No? Oh, you English. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> But the fart was, it took me by surprise. It's like, I doubted my humanity. It's like, where the hell? Who is that? <laughs> what was that, in fact? Um, anyway, yeah, sorry, you were going to probably ask something else. Um, what, does, what does photography give you that the other things don't? Oh, um, self-sufficiency. Uh, a great sense of, uh, yeah, control. Um, Excitement, really, about what I can, what, what can I do with this? You know, I mean, even on Sunday with Sean, I'm taking photographs of various bits in Covent Garden. And I, I think, well, okay, that's good, but it's a bit boring, isn't it? So I've got a couple of apps so I can tweak and twiddle stuff. And I think that's exciting. That's sexy now because you exaggerate the brilliance, the color, the, you know, transform some, some things you're a bit squiffy, you know, mm. oh, it's going like that. She, change that um yeah absolute control uh because I, I i don't use cameras anymore i use my iphone um which is portable uh, it, it's as good as my digital camera in fact you know and it's it's here you know. so um yeah i got a great deal of satisfaction with that i mean what i used to do in the 90s was really fuck up the photograph and distress it because uh, I had my own dark room and I discovered that if you bleach out the background of the, an image and then sandpaper that and then rub in inks of a different colour and a bit of oil paint and stuff. Sh would you shut up? Uh, it's like, I need attention, Dad. Yes, I know you've had, you've had chicken, okay? Sorry, this is... Meow. Look, I've got guests here. Do you mind? Come on. Anyway, um, so that was very exciting. Discovering what I wasn't good at as a painter, I could be then very good at as a photographer using 
um, painterly techniques over photography. Right. So yes, I, I still get a very great deal of pleasure out of photography actually. Yeah. Is there any, any particular piece of photographic work that you've done that you look at and you think, oh yeah, that's it? Yes. All of it? I'm not all of it. Uh, <laughs> Yes, no, I do. Um, how can I show you that? I can't really, can I? Um, it's all on my website somewhere. Um, I think it, 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 it's the stuff where I haven't been afraid to take chances with it. You know, I think the thing with photography is that you're brought up, not that I was taught photography, but you're brought up with this idea of the photograph being sacrosanct, that you can't fuck with it. You know, that's what it is. So boom, you either get it right or you don't. Whereas for me, it's like, well, this is almost right. But what happens if I do that? Mm. And suddenly you do get these incredible happy accidents, you know, which the thing about photography is that you can't ever get it the same twice. Mm -hmm. Because I used to do a lot of bleaching and toning and stuff. When you think, oh, that one's great. I need to do that again. Oh, fuck, it's not the same. Um, but now I, I don't tend to use photography as a form of art. I just use it as a form of capture. Um, I just love tweaking stuff. That Normality is quite boring most of the time. So I like to give it a bit of a zhuzh, you know. Um, yeah, I, I get a lot of pleasure out of that. Isn't it odd that they used to say a camera never lies? Oh, the camera always lies. Full of deceit. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a a deceit made up by someone. Um, the camera cannot lie because it is capturing a, a form of reality. But most photographers do something to it, whether it's in the dark room or the exposure or the lighting or the you know yeah everything is manipulated. There's very little that is actually real. Mm. Because reality is quite flat, it's quite two-dimensional, it's quite boring in some ways, you know, I find, personally. Well, you, you, your life has been filled with so many amazing <laughs> uh, adventures and uh, strange happenings. What, what are your next challenges? What are your future adventures? Have you got anything lined up or are you just seeing what unfolds? Oh, gosh. Um... It's interesting because you, you can never really second guess the future mm. i've never been able to do that i've never been able to say okay well in two years time i'm going to be doing this or that's going to happen therefore um most of my life things have just sort of fallen into place but i think the secret is to be in a state of mind where anything is possible rather than limiting yourself to say, I really want this to happen. I hope this happens. If it doesn't, I'm going to be really fucked off. And then it doesn't happen. So you're really fucked off. And it's like, well, what a waste of energy that is. But if you say, I'm absolutely open, I, I, whatever happens, happens. You know, I never thought I'd end up in TV commercials. I never thought I'd end up being a photographer. I certainly never. Well, I, actually, writing is different because I was very good at writing at school. That's how I got A-levels in writing and or English and English Lit. But it was never, that sort of receded. And when I went to art school, I thought, oh, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be a graphic designer or whatever. So writing only came about again way, way in the future, only in the 2000s. And that's through Barbie Wilde, who introduced me to her mentor, a guy called Dean Drinkle who got me into one horror anthology of a short story. Mm. And that, you think, oh, that's great. I don't have to think of a story, a motive, a, a storyline, blah, blah, blah. It's like, this is your theme and you've got 5,000 words. And that's very liberating. That's very exciting. Mm. So I've done, I think I've done 11 short stories now, plus my novella. And I find writing is, is wonderful. It's very liberating because I don't have to answer to everyone else. But I, or anyone else, rather, <laughs> I, but I do have to submit to an editor who, who might say, okay, take that out. Hmm, really? Yeah. Keep, this, keep the flow going, lose that. Oh, okay, whatever. Um, so, yes, I, I find that writing photography, um, I'm getting back into painting again now. 
which is why I've got green fingertips. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, I, I, I don't have plans for the future. I mean, my, my main plan is staying alive, to be honest, uh, especially over the last couple of years. It, it's like everyone I know has had or is having COVID. Um, sorry to bring that back into the, well, not back into the, into the conversation, but, um, you know, it's been a major concern for me and almost everyone else. But um, it's like I am very careful and I'm very cautious. And it has limited my social activity over the last two and a half years. When I'm getting back into that a bit, uh, I won't go and see bands. I have been to the cinema. I've been to, I don't go to clubs either. But going through an airport, you know, I went to Germany back in April, May, June, fuck it. Um, and it was like, oh God, you know, airport, people, planes, uh, mask yeah. on, sanitizer. It's okay, done with that. Um, so I find Star Wars conventions very exciting because I'm meeting a lot of people and I find that their enthusiasm for something I did 40, 40 years ago <laughs> is quite wonderful. Yeah. And you see three generations now, you get dad who's my age or maybe your age, their kids and their kids. Mm -hmm. So you've got three, three generations and they all love fucking Star Wars. And it, that's very gratifying to think that I was a little part of that. Yeah. The major part, nothing, you know, stand out, but just a little tiny fraction of that. Yeah. It's like a mosaic of, of life, you know, it's a huge picture and you're that little bit there. And you think, well, that's better than not being in it at all, you know. And it's not luck. I, I was good at what I did and I got rewarded for that. And I think a lot of people that, that see the Star Wars movies think that, oh, people like you, you well, you were just cast because you you, you look right. No, we <laughs> were cast because we were good at what we did. That's how we got the audition. <clears throat> I'm not knocking, you know, background artists, but that is what they do, that they hired to stand there in that costume. Mm. We were hired because of what we could do to make that costume come alive, which is what we did. And I'm very, very grateful. I'm grateful for everything that's happened to me. I, I'm, you know, I, I, there's been bad times, obviously. I think we all have bad times, but uh, I think you tend to, <coughs> if you're clever, you tend to push them down and concentrate on what is actually good and what is happening now. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what is happening now, but I'm still going for casting commercials. I'm still taking photographs. I'm still, um, well, attempting to paint, you know, and it's good. It, it's, I don't, I think if one, if one is a creative person, you don't actually stop. It's not like, oh, I'm 65, I retired now. No, you don't. I mean, look at Picasso, look at any artist, if they don't even have to be famous or world famous, you, you don't stop. It's in your blood. Whatever it is, you know, it could be needlework. It could be collecting thimbles. God, I actually did a commercial with a lady who collected Victorian <laughs> thimbles. It's like, okay. Fantastic. You know, it's not the most exciting hobby. Yeah. You know, if she said, oh, I, I collect stuffed armadillos, it's like, wow, cool. Uh, but no, Victorian thimbles, it's like, yeah, my pet dream is to have a photographic large table coffee book of my photographic art of London. Mm -hmm. And if you look at my Facebook page, there's an album called London. And that's all, all the photographs I've been taking of London over the last three or four years. I would love some big fuck off American publisher to say, hey, God, Timmy, these are such great photographs. I want to do a coffee table book. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've enjoyed that. Thank you. So have I. Um, yeah, can really I get good. to see this at some point? Or No way. Maybe? No, we're not okay. recording it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> You've got a nice necklace Sorry. on which I can barely see there. What is that? A what? No. You, lady. What's that? What are you wearing around your neck? Oh. I've, I've got um, some blown glass in a sort of university shape. Uh, okay. I've got I've got an erasure symbol from a 1996 tour. Okay. And I've got a green cross. Um, very nice too. And, and a baby Jesus somewhere. Oh, the baby Jesus. Oh, bless you. Lots of babies.